Okay. Then let's uh, have a look at the DFTB method as such and uh, why uh, why is it worth thinking <coughs> about that and using that. And you have this uh, seen this slide yesterday already. Actually, if you want to know the history of this slide, it's the slide of my uh, boss Thomas Frankheim, and this, this this slide is floating around in the DFTB talks or I think uh, at least for two decades, but it's still valid, right? So it's uh, this 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 you can show that why it's a nice slide even after two decades. What it shows is still true. So basically, if you are kind of ordering the methods uh, depending uh, what kind of time scales and length scales you can uh, you can handle in a certain amount of time, uh, of course the, the measures are changing. Well, if the computers are getting better, better and better, but nevertheless the ordering is still the same. You have some ab initio methods where you have uh, high precision. Uh, but the time scales and the length scales are more limited, but you can, uh, what you can achieve, or you can have, uh, for example, classic and source scales, where basically you don't have uh, explicit quantum mechanics effects anymore, but on the contrary, you are super, super fast. So therefore, basically, the scales you can cover are considerably larger. And then, of course, you can go even higher and even to more coarser methods, uh, coarse grading, or even uh, finite element methods if you want to simulate very uh, big systems. So what we are aiming at is basically here in the middle is the BFPD method, uh, which is uh, between ab initio and the classical force field. What does it mean? We are still are uh, in the service uh, to still try to introduce uh, quantum mechanics, right? So the BFPD method, uh, we still implicitly include quantum mechanics into the description. However, we are not ab initio anymore. That means we have um, uh, empirically uh, fitted component, which basically is there, as you will see in a few minutes, is just there in order to compensate for all the approximations which we do in order to get as fast as possible. And this is where uh, the FDB and also the XDB methodology, uh, which you will hear from Sebastian uh, in this uh, in this pool, is located now. Uh, the kind of systems you can describe uh, with those methodologies is very uh, it's very big, and I just just pick some. Uh, choices here and what, what, what it, it should demonstrate to that basically it doesn't really matter what kind of uh, boundary conditions you have, whether it's periodic, so it's a materials and it is just a molecular system or some, uh, or even you have uh, boundary conditions like in molecular electronics where you have semi infinite uh, leads where you can even apply bias. This is uh, uh, you all described uh, based on this DFTB methodology, all the type of systems you are treating. Whether it's a biological system or an organic system, it's uh, in theory for possible. So usually, basically, you can think about DFTB as an approximate DFT. So whatever you are capable to do with DFT, usually you can do the same methodology and the same kind of systems also uh, with density function and risk time binding, or as you will hear later uh, with the ECD methodology. Now, what is the approximation behind that? What is the trick? behind uh, uh, all this method. And we are starting from density function theory from BFT. And uh, probably um, all of you know BFT already or have heard about BFT already. We are starting uh, from uh, the assumption uh, that the energy can be written as a function of the electronic density. So that means if you know how the electrons are distributed in your system, if you know that function with uh, this electron density as a function of the spatial coordinate, then you know everything about your system, right? And uh, as most uh, DFT-based codes, we are working in the cone sham picture. What does it mean? That means that basically the density which you have, you are writing it as uh, a sum of independent particle density. So basically, you are assuming that the system is composed of independent particle. The potential, the effective potential, which you'll see in a minute, is composed, of course, in a tricky way in order to include the interaction of these independent particles in some form. But the formalism that you get at the end is that uh, you can uh, treat the particles as being independent from each one. So far, it's just pure uh, density functional theory. And now the DFTV part comes, this is the line three here on the slide. It's basically when you say, okay, so we are looking for the density for the real space. Uh, electronic density. Now let's let's assume that we can compose it as a fixed part, which we know from the beginning, which is n zero, which is basically the so-called reference electronic density, and let's compose it from another part. This is the delta n, which we uh, which we call as just the fluctuations, density fluctuations, which is the one which we are looking for. So in DFTB, basically we are uh, decomposing the unknown electronic density 
in a known part which doesn't change, which you know even before the calculation starts, and in an, in a no, in an unknown part, which uh, this is that and which we are looking at and trying to search during the calculation. And if you just make uh, this assumption, then basically you can take the total energy and basically expand the total energy uh, as a function of this density fluctuation of the second order or third order, depending uh, which approach you take. Uh, here, for the simplicity, let's just go up to second order. This would be the sort of classical SEC DFTB. And you see the different terms here. We have here basically the so called bed structure term, uh, the so called repulsive term, and the so called second order term. And if you look at here, at the arguments of these uh, three different terms, I will show you in a second the definition of those terms. But what you can already realize here that the bed structure term and the repulsive term only depend on the fixed. Uh, uh, reference density. Why is that cool? Because you know that already in advance, basically, right? You fix the density, you know what it is before you make your calculation. So basically, calculating those things is not too complicated. And then there is the second order part here, which also depends on the density calculation. Now, if you want to see the explicit, uh, uh, explicit expressions for those, then those are shown in, on, this slide, on this slide. And if you are familiar with DFD, then basically the integrals you see here are exactly the same you would see uh, in DFD, which is no. the very, very minor uh, differences. So here you have the, basically the part where we are calculating the kinetic energy and the effective potential sandwiched uh, with the one uh, particle wave functions, right? And this effective potential, as you know from DFD, is composed from three different terms. It composed uh, from the external potential, which is in uh, in, in DFT, the potential of the of the cores. Then it's composed from the Coulomb interactions, uh, the Coulomb potential, which is coming from the electrostatic interaction of the density. And then there is the famous exchange correlation term, which is the one which cannot be uh, known. Uh, the, uh, what is the exact form? So we have different approximations for that. Compared to LDA, GGA, whatever. There are different kinds. We are also trying to make different kinds of approximations for the exchange correlation in order to, uh, to get uh, more and more accurate results. So that is exactly the same in DFDB. The only differences which I already discussed that here you have N0. So basically, they only depend on the reference density. Then you have the repulsive term. This is the, here the next. Uh, Next line here, uh, and if you know, again, DFT, you, you have the so-called uh, uh, double counting terms. Uh, here, you have to distract half of the heart here of the Coulomb energy. Uh, you have to distract the, the energy which comes uh, from the uh, exchange correlation potential and add the correct exchange correlation energy to that. Why? Because the exchange correlation is the only term which, uh, which does not depend linearly on the density. So you have to take into account that it's nonlinearly the density. And then in the FTD, you have also here as a last term here uh, the uh, port for function, right? So that's and that's all collected in the so-called device. And then there is a second order term which looks like uh, a Coulombic expression. Here you have uh, let's say twice the density fluctuation multiplied with the kernel, which contains the Coulomb kernel, so one over R minus R prime and the second derivative of the exchange for energy with respect of the density function, uh, that fluctuation. So far, so good. And in theory, you could all calculate this explicitly, and then you will, uh, you will get DFT. But this is not what we are doing. We are basically first deciding on the reference density, and the reference density for us is just uh, the superposition, adding up the, uh, the, uh, the density of the atoms, which are making up a system. So you are, we are adding up atomic densities. If you see on Friday, that is not a good idea to get the density of the free atom, of the isolated atom, because they are very much delocalized. And if you want to describe chemical bonds, you are much better if you compress this density a little bit. So this is why it says we are doing uh, compressed atomic densities. And we will see on Friday how we can do that and why this is good. But the main thing is, is just the, uh, it depends on atoms. Uh, and their density. And then there is the band structure term and the second order, uh, order term, which are calculated explicitly with some approximations. The approximation I will show you in a second. But the main thing is we really calculate them explicitly. So we are including the quantum mechanics through those terms. And then there's the repulsive term, which in theory, if you see the, the equation here, we could calculate, but we don't. 
Because instead of that, to repass it, we are using a, uh, are using a fitting procedure, which we all always see on Friday, in order to make to compensate for all the approximations which we, which we do in the band structure term and second order, right? So in the band structure and the second order term, we are using several approximations in order to make the metal fast. But of course, if you approximate, you get more uh, less accuracy. But with uh, using the repass, you're not calculating explicitly, but fitting it, uh, for example, uh, in a, by taking our initial results uh, into account, we can just compensate some of these inaccuracies. And that makes a very nice balance uh, between, uh, between speed and accuracy. OK, just one word on the repulsive energy. We will, have, we will treat that much more in detail on Friday. Basically, in DFTB, we are usually in the classic DFTB, assuming that the repulsive can be as, uh, written as a sum of two body repulsives, right? So if you, if you are looking at this molecule here, let's assume I have the C2H6 uh, molecule here. If I want to calculate the repulsive energy of that molecule, I would have to take into account the repulsive interaction between carbon carbon at this uh, bond distance, then between carbon hydrogen at this distance, this distance, this distance, and so on. So we are assuming that the repulsive uh, energy is a function between species pairs and depending on the distance between, uh, between the atoms for the species pair conformation. You will hear on Friday from me that you can go beyond that. You can also include higher, uh, higher body terms, free body terms, and make it even more accurate. This is something you will explore on Friday. But uh, in the classical DFTP picture, very often it's a, it's a two center approach. And how is it fitted? Is it fit? It's fitted in a sense that we are basically taking ab initio, usually ab initio calculations. This is basically uh, written up here. You can uh, basically say that you have a repulsive. Uh, which between two species A and B, then you could calculate basically the energy what you get for that interaction of initial with an ab initial method, EFT, or even something even more precise. And then you are subtracting from that for this interaction those terms we are explicitly calculating, and the rest is the one which we are missing, and that you pack into the repository. So at the end, at least for the system you are using for the fitting, if it's just one system, you would uh, basically get back the exact ab initio energy, right? Of course, things are not that simple. Uh, the art is to create repulses, which I also put not just for that one system where you use for the fitting, but for a, a wide range of systems. And therefore, uh, we will have the session on Friday on the parameterization, and we will have more details about that. Okay. So that's the empirical part. What are the parts which we are calculating explicitly? Because there we still have to make approximations to make sure that the metal gets faster than DFT. And uh, just once more to remind you, what we have to calculate for the band structure term uh, is the, this kind of integrals, right? So the one particle wave function, and here the kinetic energy and the effective Poisson energy. And uh, we have to solve this eigen equation. This, uh, Find the eigen function, a function which are the uh, one particle wave functions, and their eigen energies epsilon i, which is the one particle energy. So far, it's pure BFD. How do you solve these equations? Very often, you are choosing a basis, right? So you are saying, okay, I would like to represent my wave functions with something which I know already. So basically, we are writing that the wave functions, the one particle wave functions, linear combination of atomic orbitals. So we have an atomic orbital basis. With all the advantages and disadvantages of atomic orbital phase, right? So you know that atomic orbital phase is very nice if you have a lot of vacuum because you don't have to describe that vacuum, right? In contrast to plane wave methods where you are also describing the vacuum, so you need a lot of basis functions. But of course, uh, if you have very, very delocalized states, then usually atomic, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to uh, describe uh, with uh, atomic, uh, uh, atomic orbitals. And in BFTB, additionally, we usually have a minimal basis or something which is very, very close to the minimal basis. So the number of basis functions compared to ab initio methods is very low, which is quite good because that means the Hamiltonian, which you get at the end, the Hamiltonian matrix, which is here, is small. And basically, because now we are composing our wave functions as a, um, as a sum, as a linear combination of low wave functions, then solving the problem that uh, uh, solving the problem reduces to find those coefficients c. So basically, those are the eigenvectors, the coefficients of the eigenvectors. And if I, if I find those coefficients, then I know the solution. 
And of course, the nice thing is it turns this complicated thing here, this differential equation, it turns into basically a generalized eigenvalue problem, so linear algebra problem. And you know, the nice thing is all our computers, HPC centers, and GPUs are very, very well made for making linear algebra. This is what uh, they are optimized for. So we are turning that into linear algebra problem. Okay. And because, just one last word on that, because we have less basis functions or matrix is smaller, and therefore, if the matrix is smaller, you can diagonalize it faster. Now, what we are missing is the effective potential. And uh, we are basically writing this effective potential as the sum of atomic contributions. So we are saying, OK, the, the general uh, effective potential in the system can be written as a, as a portion of uh, atomic uh, potentials. And with that, you can basically write up the DFPD, uh, the, the, the Hamiltonian. And here I, I made some groupings uh, to, to demonstrate to you what is, uh, what is done at the end. So basically, if, if you are writing up the Hamiltonian matrix, there are two cases, either the orbitals, uh, the orbital pair for which we are calculating the elements are the same atom. This is the first line, or they are on different atoms. This is the second line. And uh, basically, I was just making some uh, intelligent groupings. So for the case where the two orbitals are on the same atom, I was just grouping together here the kinetic energy operator and just the potential coming from that single atom on which these two terms are located. And in the case of the uh, in, in the second uh, in the second line, in the case where I'm just basically putting uh, the orbital uh, mu is an atom A and the orbital mu is an atom B, I was here grouping together into this integral the potential which comes from atom A and atom B, and all the rest is here in the red one and those are here in the red one. Uh, the, 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 the above one here, the red, this is for the crystal field terms, and those are here, the, the free center terms. And basically, the big approximation, the next very big approximation in DFB is whatever is red is not calculated. Right? So basically, the crystal field terms and the free body terms, uh, the free center terms, are negative. Have you seen a second why this, this, this gives you a, a very big advantage? And then a further approximation, even for this on so-called on-site blocks, where we are talking about orbitals being on the same atom, we are not calculating these integrals, but we are assuming that this uh, that this this block is zero unless we are talking about the same orbitals. And then instead of calculating those orbitals, we are just replacing them by the eigenvalue of the of the free atom. Why? Because if you take two atoms and tear them apart, if they are, if they are far away from each other, you will end up with a system where you have only twice the eigenenergy of the individual isolated atoms. And in order to have that dissociation limit correctly in the method, we are just setting uh, those values fixed. There are ways to correct those elements and uh, XTB, when you will hear about XTB, you will hear that you can correct it uh, via either empirically or by a, a higher multiple moment. But uh, in the basic DFTB methods, they are just fixed to the uh, atomic numbers of the three atoms. <clears throat> And then we have the sum here of the two potentials, the two effective potentials, atom A and atom B. And there are two ways you can calculate them. Either you are just calculating really the effective potential of atom A, which you can, which you can do if you know the density of atom A. And of course, we know that because this is for fixed reference density. And then you take the same for atom B and calculate it. Or if you want to account for the nonlinear nature of the exchange correlation potential, you can do the, another trick. You can just add up the densities of atom A and atom B first, and then calculate the effective potential. And in the FTD, there are examples for both approaches. The left one is the potential superposition. So if you ever hear the, the word potential superposition, we are talking about that approach. Uh, the right one is so the density superposition. Why you should know it? Because there are sets which are done with, uh, with either uh, super potential, potential superposition or density superposition. If you don't parameterize, you don't have to care. You just use the parameterization and that's it. But if you parameterize, or if you want to extend those sets, you would have to know what they were calculated with which approach, because then you would have to extend them with the same approach. Now, where does it lead us to? Basically, if you make those approximations, you end up with a very, very simple Hamiltonian, which you see there uh, up on the screen. Uh, the on-site elements are super easy. They are just the uh, elements of the three atoms, which we can calculate once for every atom in the periodic system, and then we know what are the uh, what are the eigenlevels of the electrons of the isolated atoms. 
And then uh, the, the other term uh, for the, for the um, offside blocks where two different atoms are involved are something which only depends on atom A and atom B, but not on anything around it. Right? So you have to think about that. You, have, you, you pick two atoms from a very, very complicated system. You want to write up the Hamiltonian, which are uh, for the block of these two atoms. And it turns out you don't have to care about the neighborship. It doesn't matter. It's always the same. But there are these two atoms, if they have a certain position and a certain angle to each other, but they are, the, uh, they are embedded in a carbon bulk, or they are embedded just in an organic molecule, as long as the distance and the angle is the same, the integral is the same. So what does it mean? We can calculate those integrals before we make the calculation, because it will be always the same. And this is exactly what we do. It turns out that basically, if you want to calculate the interaction between various orbiters, here just depicted for two p orbiters, the interaction of two p orbiters, which are located like here at the arrow, it turns out you can decompose them into a linear combination of, a, of an interaction of two, two p orbiters, which are along the line, pointing to each other, which is a pp sigma interaction, and a linear combination of a pp uh, interaction where the two p orbiters are parallel to each other, so the pp pi. And the only thing which matters is if you know what is the distance between the two orbiters and what is the angle between the two orbiters, then if you have those integrals tabulated on the right-hand side, you can just linear combine those two and you get immediately the Hamiltonian element. And this is basically one of the big uh, speed advantages of TFTP. You can just uh, calculate the Hamiltonian, it's just a table lookup. We are storing those integrals or the calculated in advance. This is what you find in these STF tables, the STF files which we discussed yesterday, and the DFTB just has to look it up, make this very simple uh, linear combination, and you get immediately the Hamiltonian element. So building up the Hamiltonian is for free. You don't have to make any excessive integration during your calculation. You do the integration work once forever in advance. So basically, what you start with at the end, the usual DFTB calculation and geometry, the tabulated integrals and the repulsive energy, which you fit in some home, and the calculation itself, we are making a table lookup in order to extract the Hamiltonian and the overlap for the given system. We are making the diagonalization usually, and then we are making the table lookup for the repulsive, and then basically we are done. And at the output, you have exactly the same quantities you would have in the ab initio calculation. You have energies, forces, and you have also quantum, mechanic, uh, quantum mechanics related uh, quantities like band structures, iron vectors. We can even plot the density, which we will do today. So we will really show you how you can plot the electronic density for a given system. So basically, you have the full quantum mechanics. Okay. There is, however, one thing we didn't consider yet. Of course, if you put uh, together two atoms which have different electronegativities, there will be a charge transfer between them. And that's we still have to describe. And that's the missing third term, the, the, the second order term, which I didn't talk about yet, but we should do it very quickly now, which is the, that term here um, in the gray box. And basically what we are assuming is that you can write it as a sum of uh, atomic charges, atomic density fluctuations, and that this density fluctuation can be represented very well with, uh, with the atomic uh, net charges. So basically monopole, uh, monopole uh, charge distribution. You can go also beyond the monopole approximations. Uh, again, Sebastian, we talk about that in, uh, with, uh, in connection with the XTB method. But for the moment, let's just concentrate on very basic uh, DFTB theory. So you can just assume that they are just uh, monopoles, so they are spherically symmetric. And then it turns out that the energy which you have to, uh, to ca calculate is basically like a Coulomb energy, right? You have, you have two charges which are multiplied with each other and with something uh, which you call the gamma, uh, gamma electrostatics, which, uh, which couples these two charges with each other. And how is this uh, gamma derived? We are assuming that the atomic charges have a certain uh, certain shape, so an exponential decaying shape. So we are assuming that the atom, the density of the atoms is exponentially decaying, which is a very good approximation, of course, and very good assumption. And it's very, very important that we have a physical picture for this density. And you will see that when you are talking about the transport uh, with, uh, with Alex, because this enables us to map the quantities, the charges which you get in the FTB, we can really map it on a real space grid. And basically you can, you can even solve the Poisson equation on a real space grid using exactly those charge shapes. So basically in the FTB, it's very important, the electrostatics which you get, it's a physically motivated one, and you have a very, very well-defined charge distribution behind that. 
And then uh, you can derive basically the, the formula for the interaction of those charges. And uh, here you have, there is one free parameter here, uh, which is basically the steepness for the, the decay, uh, how fast this uh, charge distribution decays. And this is something which is basically in the DFDB picture. It's, uh, it's something which is determined by a initio calculation because we are calculating, uh, we are ensuring that in the short length limit, uh, this expression, this, uh, this uh, Coulomb expression, goes into the chemical hardness, which is the second derivative of the atom with respect of the charges. So basically, we have the right, uh, right zero, uh, R zero limit. And the nice thing here is that uh, the, 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 the second derivative of the energy of the atom with respect of the charges, this energy is calculated for the isolated atom with pure DFT, including everything DFT offers, including exchange correlation. So basically, with the help of this electrostatics, we are a little bit mimicking also exchange correlation-like interactions in DFTB for the short range. And then it ends up basically in an, in an expression, which is 1 over R minus the short range term. Okay. Good. And basically, at the end, what does it give us? It gives us a self-consistent scheme like you have in DFT. In DFT, you have self-consistent fields. In DFTB, you have self-consistent charges. And what does it mean? The Hamiltonian now depends on the charges. The charges are calculated, Mannequin charges like are calculated from the density matrix. But in order to get the density matrix, in order to get the density matrix, you have to know the, the solution of the system. So the eigenvectors, which are basically the eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. So you are kind of trapped. It's like in catch 22, somehow you have to get out of that. So what do you do? You first assume certain charges. With the charges, you are creating a Hamiltonian. From this Hamiltonian, this Hamiltonian you are diagonalizing. From the eigenvectors, you are creating the density matrix. From the density matrix, you are creating new charges. And now you, you look it up. Are those charges the same which I started with? Probably not. Okay, then let's do the thing again. Then we are diagonalizing the building uh, of the Hamiltonian, and so on, and so on. Again, getting new charges, and we are doing it as, as long as it doesn't converge. And thus, this is the self consistent charges. And as I said, this is completely analogous to the SCF. Convergence in uh, PFT methods. You can do on, that, on a similar uh, on a similar approach. You can also disguise spin polarization. I, I I won't go into details here, but basically a similar approach, and uh, you can also extend it also to non collinear spin, uh, which is also in, uh, implemented in DFTB plus. You can also beyond go beyond the second order, is the third order DFTB. It's uh, uh, it can be important for uh, certain for the energetics of certain interactions. And there is an entire parametrization set which is based on this uh, third order DFTB. I also don't want to go into, into details, but depending on what kind of systems you calculate, this may be uh, interesting for you and uh, applying it to your systems. Okay, and then basically, you know, uh, one thing is just uh, as a kind of summary is uh, so what is DFTB? DFTB is an approximated DFT, and basically, whatever you have in uh, DFT. You can also do it in an approximate way in the DFTB. So the DFTB is basically a theoretical framework, right? So whenever you have an extension to DFT, there's a fair chance that you have uh, following the guidelines on DFTB, all the approximations are made, you can cook it down into the DFTB picture. And this is exactly the reason why you can have, for example, linear response, TDDFT, transported into DFTB. And that will be one of the sessions which we have in this course if you want to calculate excited states. Or you can also have uh, time, uh, time propagation. Again, this is something you can do here with this dynamics in DFT. And of course, you can do the same also in DFTB. Or for example, Green's function based transport. This is again, also we will have an example here, basically in this, uh, in, uh, in this course. Whatever you can do using this function formulas in DFT, you can cook it down also into the DFT feature or range separated functions or whatever. So usually, it's always possible to do the same approximation uh, with, with the DFTB approximation, the same things as you do in DFT. Whether it's worth to do that or not, it depends. It depends whether the accuracy of DFTB is good enough for that feature or for your purposes, right? Because of course, some of the approximations have uh, the price. And of course, we always try to do it in a way that the computational effort is still small. So basically in DFTB, usually you never do any calculations where you, you, have, inter you have to integrate during the calculation. We always try to avoid it in order to be fast as fast as possible. As for the performance, um, you can do the same tricks as in uh, initial DFT, but we are usually uh, usually uh, faster 
because the Hamiltonian is smaller, right? But of course, we have to diagonalize a matrix. Matrix diagonalization scales cubically. That's the same for us. There are ways in initial DFT to go order n. You can do exactly the same also in DFTB, exactly also for the same price. That's what it is. And finally, what I would like to mention to conclude my talk, that basically DFTB is not just as a standalone thing which you can run as a program, but it's also available as a library. And we will have also a session on uh, embedding DFTB Plus into an environment, into other software packages. And uh, there are two ways to do that. Of course, you can just put the DFTB Plus standalone in your software package, or you can use this library interface. Uh, we have a C interface and the Fortran interface. So basically, if you have something like, like uh, you want to use DFTB Plus from Python directly without any file communication, you will see an example for that when we are talking in this, uh, in this pool about the uh, external tools, then you can basically use function calls, C function calls, in order to communicate uh, with the class. And of course, it's everything open source. And if you would like to use the code, or even better, if you would, if you would like to join us and develop the code, you'll find it on the two addresses which you here. see here. And I would be very happy if you would become part of the DFTB plus community. Thank you very much.